Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome back for part two of Evolution Part Two. So now we're going to look at some of the biologic evidence that supports the theory of evolution. So to date, scientists have described approximately 1.7 million species, and there could be up to tens of millions of them which we've not yet recognized. Now, of these unrecognized species, the vast majority are going to be organisms which are more easily overlooked. So it's going to be things like single-celled organisms, plants and insects. The thing we need to bear in mind, though, is that all existing organisms are descended with modifications from ancestors that lived in the past. So this means at the most basic level, all life on Earth is related to one another. Now, because we, you know, the theory of evolution predicts this relationship, we should be able to see fundamental similarities between life on Earth. So, at the most basic level, we should all be made of the same stuff. So life on Earth consists of carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and phosphorus. And that goes for all life on Earth. So that's a good piece of evidence to suggest which we are related. Then there is the genetic information and the way it's stored. So life on Earth stores its genetic information in the form of DNA. This is shared by all life on Earth. Now, there are going to be variations in how that DNA is stored. Some cells will simply allow the DNA to be loose inside the cell, while some cells will have the DNA organized into nice little bundles, which we term chromosomes. So, yes, the, basic, the way we're storing our genetic information is the same, but there will be differences in the way that DNA is contained within the cells. Then there are also going to be similarities in the way that cells synthesize proteins. Now, obviously, this is going to be different for animal cells and plant cells. Obviously, plant cells have the capacity to produce their own nutrients, whilst animal cells obviously have to bring their nutrients in. But nevertheless, there are going to be similarities in the way that all plant cells operate and the way that all animal cells operate. Now, there are also going to be some non-fundamental similarities. Now, these are similarities which are going to be shared by you know, large numbers of animals, but not all animals. So, for instance, you know, that would be things like the need for oxygen to respire or the need to sexually reproduce. So, you can see based on these very broad uh, factors that we, you know, there's a good chance that we are related to each other. So... What can biochemistry, which studies things like proteins, amongst other compounds, tell us about how closely or distantly related we are to other organisms? So let's think about blood proteins. So when we look at human blood proteins and we compare them to the apes, we can, or should I say the, uh, the primates, we can begin to see how closely or distantly related we are to members of that group. So based on, our, based on blood protein chemistry, we are most closely related to the great apes. So that's gorillas, chimpanzees, and orangutans. We are slightly more distantly related to the old world monkeys. So that's organisms like baboons. We are even more distantly related to the new world monkeys. So that's spider monkeys, howler monkeys, and woolly monkeys. And we are most distantly related to the lower primates. So that's animals like lemurs. So simply by comparing blood proteins, it's a very simple and efficient method of showing us which organisms we are most closely and distantly related to. We can also use other biochemical tests to support, you know, to look at the relationships between quite different organisms. So we can use the uh, biochemis biochemistry of birds and reptiles, and we can compare them, and we can see that, yes, although they are very different animals, they are related to each other. And so what we can do is we can then use this even more and we can support it with evidence from the fossil record to help back up what we're seeing in the biochemistry. So our basic elemental composition, the presence of DNA and our biochemistry say that organisms are related and it's you know, pretty decent evidence. So is there anything else that we can see that shows us that organisms are related to each other? Well, yes, we can look at structural similarities. So let's begin by thinking about the forelimbs, okay? So you know, what you and I would call our arms. So when we look at the forelimbs of humans, whales, dogs, and birds, we can see that they are very dissimilar. However, that dissimilarity is a purely superficial thing. 
So if we actually look at the bones in the forelimbs, the way those bones are arranged, the way the muscles are arranged, the way the nerves are arranged, and the way the blood vessels are arranged, we can actually see that human forelimbs, whale forelimbs, dog forelimbs, and bird forelimbs are actually quite similar. We can also see that there are similarities in the way that the forelimbs are arranged with regard to the other structures. So in the case of humans, we can see, you know, we have our arms, we know how they're attached to our shoulders and how that essentially you know, attaches to our rib cage and our spinal column as well. And we will actually see the same basic arrangement on how the forelimbs are attached to the human torso with whales, dogs and birds. So the way the, the forelimbs are attached are also similar and how they're arranged relative to other parts of the body. There will also be similarities in the patterns of embryonic development, so how, the, how these forelimbs are developing whilst the organism is growing. So even though the forelimbs look very superficially different, they are in fact very, very similar. So these are referred to as homologous structures, and for instance, the, things like the basic vertebrate forelimbs essentially are modified for different functions and we can see that when we look at the bones and we'll discuss that in just a second. However, the fact that we have these homologous structures, so the fact we share the same bones, the same muscle arrangement, the same nerve arrangement, the same blood vessel arrangement, is a very strong indicator that we are all descended from a common ancestor, obviously with modification over time. So let's have a look at these forelimbs here. So we can see we've got a reptile forelimb at the top, and we can see we have the humerus in brown. We have the radius and the ulna. We have the carpals and metacarpals, so that's the wrist and palm bones. And then we have the phalanges, the fingers. So the question is, is can we see these same bones in all of these animal forelimbs? And the answer is yes, we can. So obviously we have the humerus there. We can see it as a dark brown. That's in all of them. Then we have the radius and the ulna. Now, in the case of horses, the radius and the ulna are fused together. Cats have them. In the case of the bat, the ulna is actually quite small. It is there, though, so bats have them, birds have them, and whales have them. So then we have the carpals and metacarpals, so the wrist and palm bones. Yes, 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 yes. Got one there, yes and we have them here on the whale as well. And then we have the phalanges or the finger bones in yellow. So yes, there are significant differences in the way that the bones look. I mean, for instance, if we look at the bat bones, we can see they're very slender and thin because obviously a bat's a flying animal, it needs to conserve weight. In the case of the whale, however, we can see these bones are much shorter, much more stoutly constructed, and that's because you need to attach very big, powerful muscles to them. And obviously, if you attached a big, powerful muscle to a thin bone like this, it would break the bone. So you need to have big, chunky bones in order to support those big muscles. So yes, there are differences in the size and shape of the bones. However, the same bones appear again and again and again, and this clearly demonstrates that we are all related to each other. So we can see the same thing in this diagram, it's the same thing just with slightly brighter colours. So we can see humerus in purple, radius in orange, ulna in kind of beige, carpals in yellow, metacarpals in green, and phalanges in blue. So you can see once again, we have the same bones, but obviously there are, there's slight variation in the uh, size and shape of the bones, and also there's slight variation in their arrangement as well. So obviously we can see differences in size and shape, as we've discussed already for whales and bats, but then when we compare humans and cats, the way the bones are arranged are actually remarkably similar, until we get down here to the phalanges. So in the case of a cat, for instance, the phalanges are literally coming out at 90 degrees to the metacarpals. In the case of human beings, the phalanges and metacarpals just continue on from one another. So, you know, there are going to be differences in arrangement as well, but nevertheless, it's still the same basic set of bones. So 
there are going to be some similarities that occur in different animals which are actually unrelated to evolutionary relationships. So the classic example of this is wings. So birds have wings, bats have wings, insects have wings. However, when we compare the wings of insects to those of bats and birds, we can see there is very, very strong differences in the structure and the embryonic development of these wings. So we can see that birds and bats are related for a couple of reasons. Number one, we have the same bones, so we have humerus, sorry, humerus there. We have the radius and ulna. We have the carpals and metacarpals, and then we have the phalange. So we can see the same bones. That's a good, strong indicator they're related. We can also see that the wings themselves consist essentially of skin stretched over the bone. So obviously we can see it with the bat, we can see it here with the bird, and obviously the bird it has the additional bonus of feathers as well. Now what about the fly though? We can see the fly's wing consists of essentially a chitinous protein, and that's held rigid by these fluid-filled vessels. So we can see it's a completely different design and it's going to develop in a completely different fashion as the animal is growing. So such structures are termed analogous structures. So they appear at a very superficial level to be similar, which would suggest that the animals are related. However, when you actually look at them carefully, you can see they are very, very dissimilar. And as such, you realize very quickly the animals are very, very, very distantly related to each other. So what about vestigial structures? So vestigial structures are remnant structures that were functional in an organism's ancestors, but no longer are. So the classic example of this is the dew claw on the forelimb of dogs. So this is a, a standard dog's paw. So obviously these four digits are going to be in contact with the ground, but this fifth digit, which would essentially be the thumb, is not. So once upon a time, dogs actually would have walked with all five digits in contact with the ground. However, what happened over time is they adapted and they became what we refer to as toe walkers. So they are essentially just putting the weight on the toes of their foot. And this means that the what would you classify as the big toe or the thumb would essentially no longer be in contact with the ground. So the question is, well, why would, you know, why would dogs adapt to this toe walking style? Well, the first reason is it's just more energy efficient. It's just easier to do. Another thing is that only having four toes touching the ground, again, is actually ever so slightly more energy efficient than having all of your digits touching the ground. And of course, this means over time, big toes, the big toes and the thumbs essentially have either been removed or they've reduced in size because they're not being used for anything. And if given enough time, they will slowly disappear. So what about human beings? Do we have any vestigial structures? And the answer is, well, yes, we do. So we have the obvious one. So we've got our tailbone, which is, of course, a hangover from our relationships to primates. We have body hair, which is, of course, a hangover to our relationship to other mammals. We have wisdom teeth, which are, of course, a hangover from the time when we didn't have particularly great dental hygiene. And then we have a few lesser vestigial structures. So things like ear muscles. So you may know somebody that has the ability to wiggle their ears. So the fact they can do that is actually a hangover to our ancestors because being able to move your ears and you know use that to be able to pinpoint where a sound is coming from is obviously very helpful if you are trying to avoid a predator or if you're trying to find prey. Obviously, in the case of human beings, we don't need that capacity anymore. But nevertheless, the muscles to do it are still there. Human beings also have a very, very overdeveloped jaw. So our jaw is designed for pretty hard work, which is you know not really related to the type of diet that we actually have. Eyebrows and eyelashes, well, yes, they are useful to some degree, but nevertheless, we could survive without them. Wisdom teeth we've discussed. Tonsils, we don't really need them. They're just a hangover. The thymus gland, the spleen and the appendix. Well, these are obviously internal organs. They do play some part in your body's uh, functioning, but we can survive without them. They're not really required. 
And then we have uh, segmented stomach muscles, which is great if you have a six pack, but uh, for most of us that don't, unfortunately, they're not actually that important. They don't really do much. So when it comes down to it, human beings do have a lot of vestigial structures left over. So are there any more structures? Well, unlike vestigial structures, which are leftovers from our ancestors, you can also have the process of atavism. And this is the reappearance of an ancestral trait. Now, this is not a common occurrence. This is quite rare. So an example of atavism would be the reappearance of hind limbs on whales and snakes. Now, this is a reference back to the fact that they are related to organisms that used to live on land and that these organisms would have had four legs. But obviously, over time, they've evolved to lose the hind limbs. You can also have examples of horses that have three toes. So obviously a horse only has one toe, but uh, an the ancestors of the modern horse would have had a three-toed foot. And slowly over time, the second and third toe, sorry, the second and fourth toe, I do apologize, became smaller and smaller and were eventually lost and all the weight was borne exclusively by the third toe. And we can also occasionally have dolphins that have hind fins. Again, that's a feature that over time has been lost, but it will sporadically reappear. So the question is, as well, why does it reappear? Well, the genetic information to actually, you know, have a snake grow legs or to have a dolphin grow hind fins is actually there in their genetic information, because we've already discussed the idea that this genetic information isn't lost. It's just stored in the DNA, but not used. So this means normally the genes that control these features are switched off. However, every once in a while, they will become activated. And this will mean that uh, an offspring will develop with structures which it otherwise would not normally have. Now, in some cases, scientists are actually trying to reactivate these uh, switched off portions of uh, DNA to see what they do as an animal develops. And this would be quite helpful because being able to look at these switched off genes would allow us to compare what happens to other animals and it would allow us to work out our relationship to those animals, how closely or distantly related to them are we. So another process we need to talk about is microevolution. And microevolution is yet more evidence for evolution. So microevolution is essentially a rapid change, and it typically occurs in organisms which have very, very short, which are relatively short-lived, and they reproduce quickly. So an example of microevolution would be weeds becoming immune to pesticides, insects becoming immune to insecticides, rodents becoming immune to poisons, and bacteria becoming immune to antibiotics, which is a pretty serious problem we have right now. So variations in these populations allowed some variant types to be more successful bringing about genetic change. So a classic example would be you have a population of 1,000 rats, you put down a new rat poison, that rat poison kills off 900 of the 1,000 rats, but the 100 that are left can eat the poison and survive. And so what you've done essentially is you've encouraged, you've encouraged artificial selection and you've just produced a generation of rats which will have offspring who are able to essentially be immune to the poison that you've just put down. And so this is an example of microevolution. It's quick evolution, and it's happening in species which don't live very long, and they will you know, rapidly reproduce in numbers. This allows the variants to be tested very, very quickly, and obviously unsuccessful variants will be lost, and successful variants will carry on to the next generation. Now, the other thing that microevolution does is because it happens so quickly, it actually allows us to track these changes because they are on such a short time scale. Now, we also need to think about biogeography, essentially how organisms are distributed. So the distribution of an organism on the continents and in the oceans is controlled by whether an area is habitable for that organism. However, organisms can survive in habitats to which they are not suited. So a good example would be animals like rats, dogs, mongooses, pigs can survive on Hawaii, even though they are not native to that environment. 
So on the continent, we see the distribution of species is primarily controlled by climate and proximity to tectonic plates. So obviously tectonic processes can produce things like mountain ranges or rift valleys, which will be a natural barrier to the migration of organisms. But for two islands, uh, inaccessibility is the key control. Sorry, sorry, let me try that one again. But for islands, inaccessibility is the key control. So islands are primarily split into two groups. So we have continental islands, and these were islands that were once joined to the continent but became separated by rifting or sea level change. So an example of that would be something like the island of Madagascar or the island of the United Kingdom. And then we have oceanic islands. So these islands are formed by volcanic activity and they were never connected to another landmass. So that would be an example like the Galapagos Islands or Hawaii. So oceanic islands provide the best evidence for evolution. So what you can do is you can look at the organisms that are there and you can see how they relate to organisms on nearby land masses. So for instance, Hawaii had no freshwater fish, amphibians, mammals and reptiles because obviously they couldn't get there. Hawaii is just so far away it meant that only a few animals could actually make it to the islands. So the Galapagos Islands had no freshwater fish, amphibians or mammals. So Oce Oceanic Islands will have uh, distinct biotas that differ from but most resemble those of the nearest landmass. So for instance, of course, going back to the Galapagos Islands, there's obviously the similarities in the finches of the Galapagos Islands to the finches that live along the west coast of South America. The finches of the Galapagos Islands, however, are more distantly related to the finches of Europe. So typically, the more remote the island, the less diverse the biota will be, because there will be fewer animals which will be capable of making it to the islands, because it's just so far away. So in a chain, the biota of each island will differ slightly from the others. Once again, going back to the Galapagos Islands, each island will have its own slight difference in its environment, and as such, the plants and animals on that island will develop slightly differently. So it's unsurprising that organisms are most likely to populate oceanic islands. Uh, sorry, should I say that? I'm having real difficulty reading the sentence. I do apologise. So it's unsurprising that the organisms that are most likely to populate oceanic islands are those that can get there. So it's going to be things like plants that have wind-blown pollen, with the exception of coconuts, seagoing birds, and aquatic mammals, because they can make it all the way out to the islands quite comfortably. In contrast, other animals would be unable to make it. However, there are instances where organisms can get there by bad luck. So you can have continental birds that get blown way off course, or you can have things like tsunamis that pull trees out to sea, and obviously you have animals which are holding on to those trees and they get washed to nearby islands which they then populate. So when it comes to populating one of these islands, you typically need uh, a reasonable number of individuals to form a functioning breeding colony. And typically you're going to need at least 25 pairs. So you're going to need at least 50 individuals to have a successful breeding colony. So the difference between the biotas of continental islands and its parent landmass is exclusively the result of the length of the separation. So Madagascar and Africa are very, very close to each other. However, they separated 160 million years ago. So that means Madagascar has essentially been operating in isolation from Africa for 160 million years. And this obviously means the animals on Madagascar have evolved to fit the Madagascar environment and the Madagascar environment only. So there's quite significant differences between the Madagascan animals and the animals of Africa. In contrast, the United Kingdom only separated from Europe around 14,000 years ago, so there's absolutely no difference whatsoever between the animals that you can find in continental Europe and the animals which you can find in the United Kingdom. So, what do we actually learn from fossils? So, the fossil record shows the appearance of organisms throughout time, and it displays a relatively simple order. <coughs> 
single-celled organisms first, followed by multi-celled organisms, followed by plants, invertebrates, and vertebrates. Now, to be clear, this is not an evolutionary sequence. It's just a very general order that certain phylums and subphylums appear in. So, after all, plant, you know, animals did not evolve from plants. But nevertheless, it gives you a basic idea of what the order of evolution was. So this diagram kind of shows you the evolution of vertebrates throughout the uh, Phanerozoic. So you can see here we have the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, and Tertiary. And these black lines represent the uh, organisms. They represent the different groups. And the width of the line says how many different species there are. So the wider the line, the more species. And so what we can see is that in terms of the vertebrates, the fish appeared first. Okay. Now the first type of fish will be the jawless fish. And then we will steadily have the change from the jawless fish to the jawed fish. Then we'll have cartilaginous fish will slowly change and they will turn into fish with bony skeletons. So we have the jawless fish here. Then we have the cartilaginous fish here. So then we move on to fish that develop essentially bony skeletons. And then we go all the way to the modern day fish. Then fish evolve into amphibians. Amphibians evolve into reptiles. Reptiles evolve into birds and mammals. And so simply by looking at the fossil record, we can see the relationships between these organisms. And then we can do other things like, you know, comparing the structures of these organisms to back up these observations. So this is the kind of basic idea that we're trying to achieve by using the fossil record. We can work out the relationships and that allows us to essentially you know, work out how evolution was happening. So the fossil record is extremely helpful. However, it's not uncommon for the origin and initial diversification of a species to be poorly represented. So what you really want is you really want all the fossils which show you the evolution of a species. However, unfortunately, you know, the world isn't that nice. So most of the time you'll only get a fraction of the evolutionary history. However, we do have fossils that clearly show the kinds of diversification we're looking for. So for instance, we have horse fossils, rhinoceros fossils, and tapir fossils, and they show that they all evolved from a common ancestor. We can see from the fossil record that birds clearly evolved from reptiles, and we can see that whales clearly evolved from land-dwelling mammals. And this is because we're lucky and we have a good, solid fossil database in, through which we can see these changes. Now, if we're thinking about something like human beings, on the other hand, the fossil record for human beings is absolutely terrible. And this makes it very difficult to work out what the relationships are between many of the species in the genus Homo. So, you know, we need to bear in mind that the ability to actually, you know, work, use fossils to work out the evolution relationships is completely dependent on how much of material you have and the quality of it. So this brings us on to the idea of missing links. So we can agree that two groups of organisms which are closely related will have a common ancestor. So what you really want is you really want to find that common ancestor, that intermediate organism that you know, sits directly where the two different groups of species meet. So this essentially is your bridge between them. Now, in some instances, we have that fossil. In some cases, we do not. And in the instances where we do not have that fossil, that's often described as a missing link. And so the lack of this transitional fossil is a point of attack for people that don't believe in evolution. So they will say, well, you know, where's the, where's the fossil that shows you the link between species A and species B? And in a lot of cases, you won't have it. And so unfortunately, you know, it's a it's a very obvious and very straightforward thing to point out. And, you know, if you are discussing evolution, it's a you know very, very common argument against it. However, we do have examples where we have intermediate fossils between different groups. 
So we can see through the fossil record that we have the transition from fish to amphibians. It's pretty well documented. Now the problem is, is can you say, right, this is the definitive organism that represents the transition from fish to amphibians? And the answer is no. The problem is, is that there are so many different organisms which are kind of half fish, half amphibian, that it's actually quite difficult to work out which one represents, you know, the you know the most important organism, the one that actually is the link between fish and amphibians. So we need to bear that kind of thing in mind. We also can look at things like the similarities between advanced mammal like reptiles and the earliest mammals so we can see that once again looking at the fossil record we can see we have reptiles and these reptiles slowly become more mammalian in their appearance and then eventually we can see them transition into full-blown mammals once again we are lucky in this respect in that we have a pretty decent fossil record and so we can see this transition so it's obviously always very difficult to fully agree with what people want. Typically what people want is they want one nice, clear transitional species. However, in a lot of cases, we don't have that one nice transitional species. What we have are several, several different species that are, you know, somewhere around the transitional species so we don't have just one we have several examples that could be the transitional species and so that sometimes makes it a little bit difficult to work out which one is the most important in some cases of course we don't have the transitional species at all because we haven't found the fossil and so when we have these missing links it's infuriating but it's not actually an argument against evolution it's just simply a reflection of sometimes you don't get lucky So what about extinctions? So when we trace the evolution of life over geologic time, it seems that up to 99% of all species that have existed are now extinct. So at points in the Earth's history, these extinctions happened quickly and en masse. These are referred to as mass extinctions. So the assumption is that organisms will always be evolving towards higher order or greater complexity. However, vertebrates are far more complex than bacteria. However, bacteria have survived for 3.5 billion years. So when it comes down to it, the most likely organism to survive aren't always the most complex. So natural selection will not yield a perfect organism. What it does is it produces an organism that's adapted to a specific set of circumstances at a particular time. So a lizard that exists now is in no way superior to a lizard that lived in the Triassic. We need to bear that in mind. So extinctions occur in two kinds. The first kind is a background extinction, and that's just a continual loss of species, and that's a, a relatively you know, consistent process. The other type of extinction is a mass extinction, and that's a period of accelerated extinction rates which sharply reduces the Earth's biotic diversity. So you'll see lots of organisms dying out very, very quickly. So extinction is a continual process, but so is the evolution of new species. So as one, organism, as one species dies out, its niche will be taken over by a new species. And these new species will typically quickly emerge to exploit the opportunities left as another species becomes extinct. So when the dinosaurs died out, the niches that they left were very quickly taken over by the mammals and the birds. So although we think of the extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous as large, actually it wasn't the biggest one that's occurred. So that honour goes to the extinction event that occurred at the Permian-Triassic boundary 250 million years ago, which is referred to as the Permo-Trias mass extinction. And estimates of the Permo-Trias mass extinction vary, but you know it seems that up to about 96% of all marine invertebrates were killed off, and 70% of all terrestrial vertebrates were made extinct. So this was an absolutely massive mass extinction, and we'll be discussing why it occurred when we do the Paleozoic Earth history.
but nevertheless you can see from this diagram here that there have been several mass extinctions so you can see as this diagram gets wider essentially that represents an increasing numbers of species so the wider the distance the more species exist but you can see every once in a while the number of species suddenly drops so these are the mass extinctions so we then get an increase in number of species mass extinction increase in number of species mass extinction and so on so these mass extinctions are not uncommon in the slightest they are very very common in the geological record and so obviously these mass extinctions are then going to uh, open up numerous environmental niches and life will very quickly rush to try and fill those open niches Okay, everybody, so that's the end of this presentation. So let's very quickly get the code word out of the way. So the code word for this presentation is silver. I repeat, silver, S-I-L-V-E-R. So silver, like the precious metal. So please write that down and put it somewhere safe. Okay, everybody, thank you for listening and take care.